Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the one to four player game, Castles of Mad King Ludwig, designed by Ted Alsbach and published by Bezier Games, who helped sponsor this video. The king has hired you and the other players to each construct a castle, but anticipating his changing whims is no easy task, and you may even find yourself questioning your own design decisions as you're forced to make tough choices about what rooms to build and how to pay for them. In this video, I'll be teaching using the retail release of the second edition of the game. But if you have an earlier or different version, you should still be able to follow along. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, place this double-sided scoreboard in the play area. The side showing this ringed castle here is only used if you're playing with the expansions, which for the version I have is picked up separately. For the standard game, we play with this side face up. The cards with this back are the room cards. First shuffle, and then deal 11 per player into a face down deck here. We'll assume that we have two players, so we deal 22 cards and return the rest to the box. The cards with this back are known as the bonuses, which you shuffle and put face down onto this space of the scoreboard. The tokens with this back are known as the king's favors. Give them a good mix, and then add a number of them face up to the spaces here based on your number of players. Again, we have two players, so we would fill in these two spaces. Then return the rest of the unused favors back to the box. In an area nearby, create a supply for the coins, which come in values of 1,000 and 5,000. The game comes with a variety of room tiles, and in this edition, these are separated within trays by their various sizes. And you'll notice that all tiles of the same size have the same value on their backs. This is important because you'll now add a certain number of each to their matching numbered spaces on the scoreboard. Within each space, you'll find these symbols, which indicate how many tiles you need to add there. For example, in our two-player game, we need to add four of the value 500 tiles. Although the backs are the same, the faces aren't. Each represents a different type of room. So before adding any to a given space, give the tiles within that group a shuffle, and then add the required amount. In this case, four tiles. The one exception are these hallway pieces. There are two spaces on the board for these, but only use a number of them based on the icons from one of the spaces. For example, in a two-player game, we'd use five hallways total, but we can spread the pieces between the two spaces if we like. And although these hallway pieces are double-sided, it doesn't matter which side you leave face up. When you're done, it will look something like this. Next, we draw and reveal a certain number of these room cards based on this table found in the rule book. So in a two-player game, we would draw five. Each of these shows a certain room tile. So now take a tile of that type from the top of each related stack and flip them so they're face up. The cards are then set face up into this discard pile for them here. The tiles we revealed are now set below the scoreboard and we'll come back to these a little later in the setup. For now, give each player a swan and one of these foyer tiles in their chosen color. Foyers don't come from the stacks on the board as they don't have a numbered back. Each player also gains 15,000 in coins from the supply and a player aid. Then randomly choose a player to be the master builder for the first round of the game and give them this master builder token. The master builder puts their swan on the zero space of the score track. The next player in clockwise order adds their swan to the one space, and if you had a third player, they'd go here, and a fourth would go here. Each player is now dealt three cards from the bonuses deck. Secretly examine and pick two of them to keep placing the other unseen back on the bottom of its deck. During the game, you can always examine your own cards, but keep them a secret from the other players. Bonus cards show various symbols that indicate special ways that can score you points at the end of the game. But we'll learn more about these later once we know more of the rules. And that's the setup. In Castles of Mad King Ludwig, players will be buying castle rooms that provide points based on how they're added to the castle that you'll be building in front of yourself. These points will come from the rooms themselves, the king's favors, your personal bonus cards, and a few other ways that we'll learn about later. The game is played over a series of rounds, and each round is broken into five steps. During the first step, you draw rooms from the room deck, but you skip this during the very first round because we already did that as part of the setup. So we'll come back and learn about how this step works in later rounds later in this video. 
For now, let's learn about the second step of the round, pricing rooms. In the two-player game, you'll start this step with five room tiles below the board. And now the master builder, the player holding this token, arranges them in any order they choose under what are known as the market spaces, so that each tile has a unique value printed above it. But they must fill only the leftmost spaces. In a game with more players, you'll have more tiles, which are added to these spaces. One here in a three-player game, and one here if you have four players. In a two-player game, you never add tiles here. The values above each tile will be the price to buy the tiles in the next round. So in this way, the master builder is setting the prices for each one. As we'll see in later rounds, a room can have coin tokens on it. And if so, these always move with their rooms as the master builder adjusts the placement of the tiles during this step. When they're done, it's time for step three, buying rooms. This step is taken in turns, beginning with the player seated to the left of the master builder and going once around the table so that the master builder takes the last turn. On your turn, you'll either buy a tile or buy nothing and take 5,000 in coins from the bank. So let's see how you buy a tile. If you're not the master builder, then to do this, you pick any one of the tiles below the market spaces and pay the value showing above it directly to the master builder from the coins that you have. So in this case, if I wanted the tile here, I would pay the master builder 8,000 in coins. In this way, when the master builder was arranging the tiles in the previous step, they weren't only setting the prices for each room tile, but also the amount of money that they'll earn for any other player who buys a room tile. As I had mentioned, we'll see later how coins can end up on the room tiles in the market. And if you're buying a room that has coins on it, those coins are used to help you pay the room's cost to the master builder. For example, normally I'd have to pay 6,000 from my coins for a tile in this position. But now I only have to pay 4,000 of my own coins because I'd combine that with the 2,000 in coins already here to cover the full cost that's given to the master builder. Now that said, if the coins on a room exceed its cost, you keep the leftovers. For example, here the room costs 4,000, but it has 5,000 in coins on it. So I would give 4,000 of these to the master builder to pay the cost, but then keep the extra 1,000 for myself. Either way, after you've paid for a room, you then put it in front of yourself. Rather than buy a room tile from the market, you can instead pay $3,000 to the master builder to purchase either a hallway or stairs tile if any are left. When the master builder is buying a room tile or hall or stairway, they pay the required cost back to the general supply. If the master builder is buying a tile with coins on it, those coins reduce the cost they have to pay, as we saw. But again, all coins the master builder spends goes back to the general supply. So in a case like this, they'd pay 3,000 of their own money and the 1,000 here back to the supply to buy this tile. Now remember, rather than buying a tile, a player can always take 5,000 in coins from the general supply instead. And the coins are meant to be unlimited. If you ever run out and need more, just use a suitable replacement. Now that said, if you do buy a tile, before the next player goes, you must first add that newly purchased tile to your castle. So let's go back to the table and see how this very important part of the game works. You start the game with this foyer tile in front of you, which is the first room of your castle. And every room has walls around the edges and the gaps you see in the walls are its entrances, so the foyer has three entrances. When you gain a new room tile, you must immediately connect at least one of its entrances to an entrance already in your castle, and when you do this, you must line them up exactly. That said, before you decide on a final placement, you can rotate the new room by 90 degrees as many times as you like. To help fully teach the rules for adding a new room, let's pretend it's later in the game and our castle looked like this, so I can show you examples of all the different placement rules you need to be aware of. We know that you must connect new rooms to at least one other entrance in your castle, but it's okay if you end up blocking other entrances as you do this. However, after placing a new room, you must always have at least one external entrance somewhere in your castle. 
An external entrance is one on an accessible outside edge of your castle walls so that you have somewhere that a new room could be added later. This entrance, for example, is enclosed by other tiles, so it's not an external entrance. Also, room tiles must always lay flat on the table, so you can't add one in a way that would cause it to overlap another piece. Each room will have a symbol in its left corner area that identifies the type of room that it is, and there are a variety of different types. Just be aware that this swan symbol found on some tiles is for use with an expansion that's not included in the core box. We'll go through why all the different room types matter later, but any with this symbol are known as a downstairs room. To place a downstairs room, you'll first need to have placed stairs with their light side connected to your castle. Then later, a downstairs room can be connected to the dark half of the stairs like this. I should also point out, when you purchase a hallway, you can place it light side up connected to an upstairs room, or flip it to its darkened downstairs side and attach it to a downstairs room. So to summarize, a downstairs room can be connected to the darkened end of stairs like this, or to other downstairs rooms, or they can be connected to downstairs hallways. Just know you can't connect a downstairs room to an upstairs room and vice versa. That said, upstairs and downstairs rooms can touch each other just as long as none of their entrances connect. So this placement would be allowed. Another important placement rule relates to outside rooms, which will show this symbol. These will always have an exposed fenced edge, and you may never place another tile so that it's adjacent to the fenced edge of an outside room. Now, being adjacent is different than being connected. Rooms are connected if their entrances line up. For rooms to be adjacent, any part of their tiles simply need to be touching. This is why it's very important to line up your room entrances correctly so you can assess touching tiles accurately. So just remember, no room can be placed so that it's adjacent, which means touching, the fenced edge of an outdoor room. However, it is okay to touch that fenced edge as long as it's only on its stone corner. And just to be clear, you can't buy a room if you have nowhere to place it. Any room you buy must be added to your castle right away, and once it's added, it can't be moved or rotated later. After you've placed your room, you then immediately score it. And again, I'll set up a few examples to show how scoring works, but you'll find reminders of the steps here on your player aid. A number inside of a castle icon represents victory points. And after adding a room to your castle, you score the victory points showing in its upper left corner here, three in this case. Anytime you score points in the game, advance your marker on the score track here. You now score the icons in the center of the room that you just added, if they apply. This is the connection bonus symbol. To the right of it, we see symbols for two different types of rooms. So this bonus scores two victory points for every connected room of either type. For example, by adding it here, we'd score another two points because the room it's connected to has this outside symbol, just like we see on the connection bonus. And keep in mind, these central icons are always active. That means if later in the game, we connect another room to this one, in addition to resolving all the points the symbols give us for the new room, we check to see if any connected rooms earn us points. In this case, we're now connected to a new room that shows the same symbol as we have on this connection bonus. So this tile would earn us another two points. Whereas if we had connected this room instead, its room type doesn't match the bonus here, so this would not score us any more of these points. But it would still score its own points as they apply. If the central icons show this adjacent penalty symbol, which looks like a solid wall, it means you'll lose the amount of points showing here for each of the room types shown to the right that are adjacent to this room. And remember, adjacent just means that the two rooms touch in some way. They don't have to be connected by entrances. So in a situation where we put this room here, we'd lose two points for this hallway because it shows this corridor symbol that's also here, and we'd lose another two points for the food symbol we see on this adjacent room. And as I mentioned, central icons are always active. So any future room that ends up adjacent to this one that shows any of these related symbols as its type 
will cause us to lose another two victory points. Finally, we have what is known as the downstairs bonus. These are only on downstairs rooms and earn you the related amount for each room of the indicated type anywhere in your castle. This is the symbol for an activity room, so we'd earn two points for every activity room in our castle currently and for each activity room that we add to our castle later. So it's very important that when you add a new room to your castle, you not only check to make sure that you earn the points on the room you just added, but also from any other rooms in your castle that would also earn or cause you to lose points because of the tile that you just added. And by the way, in the case of this dungeon, which scores two points for every downstairs room you have, you also include this room itself. Guess what? There's another way a newly added room can score you points. If placing a tile ever causes all of the entrances of a room to be connected, you are said to have completed that room. Just keep in mind a blocked entrance doesn't count. So in a case like this, where we connected this room to the one down here, we now know we'll never be able to complete this room because this entrance can no longer be connected. It's instead been blocked by this wall. When you complete a room, you gain an immediate bonus based on the type of room you've just completed. We've seen some of the room types, but they're all listed here on your player aid along with the benefits you gain for completing each of them. So let's go through these quickly and learn how each completion reward works. This symbol represents a food room like we see here. When you complete one of these, you immediately take another turn. In other words, you again get to buy either a room, hallway, or stairs, or instead gain 5,000 in coin from the supply. If you complete a utility room, draw two bonus cards from the top of the bonus deck, secretly examine and pick one to add to your hand, and set the other unseen back on the bottom of its deck. When you complete a living room, immediately rescore the points printed on its tile, but only those points. So in this case, I'd earn the three points here, and any of this connection bonus might score. But I don't rescore points from other rooms that might interact with this room. So in other words, I don't get this connection bonus here just because this room matches the type it shows. When you complete an outdoor room, immediately gain 10,000 in coins from the supply. When you complete a corridor room, which also includes completed hallways or stairs, you immediately pick a hallway or stair from the supply, if any still remain, and then place it in your castle and score it if possible. When you complete an activity room, immediately score five points. Completing a sleeping room lets you pick any one stack of room tiles on the board and then go through it privately, taking zero, one, or two of them from that stack to set face down unseen by the other players on top of the room deck in your chosen order. Now this may seem like an odd reward, but we'll see how this helps a little later. Finally, we have the reward for completing a downstairs room. This one is quite unique because you only earn this reward for every second downstairs room you complete. In other words, we don't gain any completion reward when this first downstairs room of our castle is completed, but we will once this second one is. Likewise, you get no bonus on the third, but you do on the fourth, then the sixth, eighth, and so on. When you do earn the reward, it lets you gain any one of the other completion rewards. So I could, for example, take 10,000 in coins, or take five points, and so on. Just note, if you choose to take the living room bonus, you must use its effect to rescore the downstairs room that you just completed. And those are all the different completion rewards. And remember, if you complete more than one room at the same time, resolve your completion rewards in any order you like. And with that, you now know how to buy, place, and score a room, all of which happens during your turn of the buy rooms step. After you've finished taking your turn, the next player in clockwise order buys a room, hall, or stairway, places and scores it, or just takes 5,000 in coins. Either way, once every player has taken their turn, it's time for the next step of the round, adding coins. Here you add a $1,000 coin to each room that remains in the market even if that room already has coins, because there's no limit to how many coins can end up on a room. This means, as time goes on, rooms that players don't buy will start to get more and more attractive as they gain more and more coins. 
And with that step done, you now move to the final step of a round, passing the Master Builder token clockwise, making that player the new Master Builder for the next round, which starts with the first step, drawing new rooms, which we skipped earlier, but can now go over. For each empty market space for your number of players, you now reveal and discard a room card from the deck and place the top tile from the stack it shows into the empty spaces, which in a two-player game means you'll draw until you have five tiles in the display again. It is possible that you'll have no empty spaces at the start of a new round, in which case you just skip this step. As rounds go on, it's possible you'll draw a card showing a tile stack that's empty. If this happens, just discard that card and draw replacements until you get a tile that you can reveal in place. With this step done, the current master builder performs the price rooms step. And remember, they can leave or rearrange all the rooms in any way that they want, whether those rooms were just added or were already there from a previous round. And then you continue to the buy step as usual. You might remember though, the reward for completing a sleeping room is that it lets you draw zero, one, or two tiles from a single tile stack and set them face down on top of the room deck. If during step one of a turn, there are any tiles here, you reveal and place those to fill in the required spaces of the market. And once those are gone, you'll draw cards from the top of the deck again as usual. Now eventually, you'll draw the last card of the room deck and when this happens, finish the current round, and then the game ends. If after drawing that last card, you still have empty spaces in the market that need to be filled, reshuffle the room discard pile into a new draw deck and draw for the remaining pieces that you need. After the final round is complete, it's time for final scoring, and the steps for this are shown here on the bottom of your player aid. But let's go through each of them together. First, check which stacks of tiles on the scoreboard are empty, including the stairs and hallways. And although the hallways have two spaces, consider them to be a single space. So in this case, the hallway stack is not empty. But for each empty stack, you'll score two points for every tile of that type in your castle. So for example, this 300 stack is empty, so I'd earn two victory points for each of those tiles in my castle. We now check and score the tokens known as the King's Favors. These are resolved one at a time, and for each, the players check to see how many of their rooms satisfy the printed condition. For example, this is the symbol for food rooms, so each player checks to see how many food rooms they have in their castle. The player with the most earns eight victory points, as shown here, second most earns four points, and so on. But to score any of these points, you must have at least one of the required type. In the case of a tie, the tied players combine and split evenly, rounding down, the points for the ranks they would have otherwise claimed. Let me explain this with a bit of an example, and let's assume that we had four players. If one player had three of these rooms, and two players had two each, and the fourth player had one, then this player would score the eight points for having the most. These players who tied for second would combine the four and two points of second and third place, which is six, and then they'd split that total value, gaining three points each. The last player then earns the remaining fourth place score of one point. We won't go through all the King's Favor bonus tokens in this video, but they're all explained in the rule book here, which you can examine when they come up in your games. Now each player reveals and scores their personal bonus cards, which will award points based on the printed effects. For example, if a player was holding this bonus, they'd score an additional seven points if they have at least one of each type of room in their castle. We won't go through all the bonus effects here, but they're also explained in the rule book for when they come up in your games. Once all the bonus cards have been scored, each player earns one victory point for every 10,000 in coins they have remaining. So here with 28,000, I'd earn two more points. Now the player with the most points wins. In the case of a tie, the tied player with the largest castle wins. The size of each room is printed in its top right-hand corner here with this symbol which represents square feet. So this room is 400 square feet. Add together all of your room sizes to get your total castle size. And if there's still a tie, the tied player with the most money wins. And if there's still a tie, I mean, really? 
You still have a tie? Okay, well, in that case, the tied player who grabs the master builder token first wins. And I'm not kidding. If you truly get that far, that's what it says in the rules. The game also comes with rules for solo play, but those I'll leave for you to discover on your own. There are also expansions that allow for up to five players and provide new rooms and challenges. But otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play Castles of Mad King Ludwig. If you have any questions at all about anything that you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can join our Patreon team, which I'll have linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.